our issues with biodiversity and how to how to keep all our biodiversity, all our eggs in these baskets, which are our parks, was hard enough with land use changing. But then we throw climate change on top of it, and it just adds this entire different dimension. But it, it has been fascinating to research. And one way that I think is neat to think about it is the the first thing that um, the first problem that people started thinking about with with uh, climate change hitting species is that as the earth warms sort of habitat can shrink. So the classic example is an animal sitting on the top of a mountain, like the American pika. I don't know if anybody know about that. It's a little rabbit relative. It sits on the top of a mountain, and the uh, climate gets warmer and warmer. It starts maybe moving up the mountain, but then it hits the top of the mountain. And that ecosystem that it likes gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then it disappears. So it's sort of an area effect. But uh, what's great about that is, well, what's not great about it, but what, what has been very, uh, what, what people have been able to use the pika for is kind of raising the flag about climate change, saying, look, this is the canary in the coal mine. This is the first thing that's going to go. These are the things that we have to start making sure that we control our emissions and uh, slow the rate of, of climate change, because we're not committed to this warming. But then if you think about what a land manager, what is Fish and Wildlife Service, what is uh, California Fish and Game, what are, what is Endangered Species Act supposed to do about this? They, they can advocate for reduced emissions. We can kind of encourage everybody, like you guys, don't need to be encouraged to walk and use their car less. But it's not something that's very proactive for land managers to do. What's interesting, though, is there's many species that don't have this problem. The, the climate's going to warm, but there's plenty of other places for them to move. Maybe they like Jasper Ridge. Jasper Ridge gets too warm. Maybe they like Edgewood, which is a little bit further to the north. So there are opportunities for species. It's not all this pessimistic side. It might, in many cases, there could be more land. It could be that species in the in the south, kind of around Los Angeles Basin, where there's very little habitat left, as Big Sur area, which is very intact, becomes more like that. There's the potential for those plants, which are very restricted now, to expand into much more area. So there are opportunities in climate change. And I think that's something that land managers can get excited about. But there's one huge catch, and the catch is, can these species make these movements in time? And that's a huge uncertainty because these changes are happening about 10 times faster than species have ever had to move before. And a classic example of it is um, this serpentine grassland we're on right now, which had the, uh, the bay checker spot butterfly. And this butterfly lived just on these serpentine grasses. It's, it can only have, a, its food plant is this little plantago erecta right now, which you can see, it's funny because I just came from the other side of the ridge and it's all dried up there, but it's still good here. But these guys have to do their whole patch and turn into caterpillars and cocoon before this little thing dries up. And it was probably fairly common that that didn't happen in time. A dry, a dry year came by, this population probably went extinct. But there was a little thread of serpentine that weaved its way through here over to Edgewood. It would weave its way down, a little kind of like stepping stones, hopping down to um, south of San Jose, sort of the Coyote, Coyote Creek, Creek region. And it was over the sort of slow, a, a bad year here, a bad year there. These are like little lights blinking on and off. And this population might go extinct, but another population would kind of stochastically, a random event would sort of find its way, meander back here. And that was good. It was in this sort of equilibrium of these populations blinking on and off but not going. But what's happening now is this population went extinct. Oh, it's okay, we have butterflies at Edgewood. The Edgewood population went extinct. And now we go, okay, we've got butterflies on the other side of San Jose. But how do those species cross San Jose? All right, how do they cross with this huge front of, of suburban landscape in the middle? And also, as, as climate starts moving and San Jose becomes inhospitable and they have to move up here, they have to do that so fast that these rare events that of, of them being able to get here are just are, they're, they're less and less common. So what, how this links into my recent research is we were thinking about so the pike is an animal where you know just we have to stop emissions, but there's not a lot of proactive things we can do. But what about these opportunities where there's land available? Can the species get there in time? And so what we try to do is, is quantify how fast do these species have to move. So we, we asked a sort of interesting question is when most people think about how how fast is climate changing? They say, they think about degrees per year. So how fast is climate changing? I'm standing here and in 10 years it might be 0 0.03 degrees. In 100 years it might be a, a, a couple degrees warmer. So um, uh, that's a temporal rate, it's degrees per year. But there's another side of that question, which is just in today's world, forget time, but think about space. How far do I have to go to change my climate right now? And Jasper Ridge is another great example for that because we have this, we're on the ridge right now, but this whole side here, see that chaparral? That's a south facing slope. So it's exact same precipitation, but it's sitting, it's pointing at the sun a little bit more. It's a little hotter and a little drier. Down there is this north facing slope, which is more sort of mixed evergreen, bay, some, uh, some madrone, which is same precipitation, but a little bit cooler. 
So here, I say, okay, I'm, in, I'm, I'm sitting over there, it's hot. I want to get a little cooler. How far do I have to go? Just hop right over there. So that's not degrees per year. This is degrees per kilometer. So I might have to go just a few kilometers and you know, change a little bit, half a degree or so. If I'm on a steep mountaintop like the Sierra Nevada, it might be even, even quicker. I just have to go up a little bit in elevation. I could totally change my degrees. The problem is there's places like the uh, Central Valley where if you're in the center of a huge flat area that's total, totally homogeneous, you might have to go really, really far to change. So you're in the middle of the Central Valley, you're, it's, a, it's a hot day, you want to get to a place that's a degree cooler. The, the, it's so homogeneous around you that you might have to go 50 kilometers to get to a place that's cooler. So we took these two rates of how climate changes, degrees per year and degrees per kilometer, and we divided them and you come up with kilometers per year. How fast is climate changing? So then you can think about climate as just sort of sweeping across the landscape and how fast you have to, do to go to keep up. But what's interesting is it integrates these, these two things. How fast is the world warming? That's emissions. We have to stop emissions. But how accessible are different climates to species? That's this proactive thing that we can do for things like the butterflies. We can make our landscape such that animals can access different climates. And this suddenly becomes, it becomes a really kind of proactive thing as opposed to the pica where fish and wildlife, cow fishing game, they get really excited about this because all of a sudden it's not saying, ah, we have to convince people to, 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 drive, to drive their cars less and we have to sign these international sort of carbon treaties. It's saying we can connect up our landscapes. We can do exactly what Walk the Farm is doing. We can say, shoot, you know, we have uh, the foothills over there. We have a, a, a Webb Ranch right there. We have Jasper Ridge. As the climate's changing, how do species move through here? And then we get right back to Walk the Farm, which is exactly what you guys are doing. So it's, I, I just think it's it's such a neat way to sort of connect climate change to just this local scale. And um, the last thing I want to say is I think it really switches the way that we think about protected areas. Because before, we were so species focused that we said, you know, we want to protect the species, we're going to build this park around the species, we're going to tailor this park to the species. But now we can't really do that. Species are moving around. We really have to think about the protected area, not just as a portfolio of species, but as a portfolio of climates, a portfolio of habitat. And we need to know what's, what might disappear from Jasper Ridge, but what might come. How do we keep stuff that might disappear from Jasper Ridge? How do we make sure it gets to the next place it might show up? How do we get the stuff that we want to come to Jasper Ridge to encourage to come here? So all of a sudden you start thinking of your protected area. It's a much more sort of landscape approach. And it's, it's interesting because I think it opens up all sorts of possibilities for climate change, for, uh, for conservation biology, but it was sort of motivated by climate change. So it is a way that I think we can use a sort of crisis to kind of really start thinking outside the box.